Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with Lisa Congdon. Hi Lisa. Hello. <laughs> Great to have you on the show. Just a little introduction. Lisa is a fine artist, illustrator and creative entrepreneur. She's also the author of a number of books, including Art Inc, The Essential Guide for Building Your Career as an Artist. So Lisa, you came later to art. How did you make that move from a real job as a project manager to becoming a full-time artist? Well, it took many years, but and it happened um, at least initially sort of on accident. When I was about 31 years old, I um, decided to take a painting class just for fun. I had a full-time job, as you mentioned, working in education nonprofit uh, here in the United States, and I um, felt the urge to do something creative. So I took this painting class, and then... Um, I fell in love with painting. I was not very good at it, but this one class sort of changed my perspective about, um, I don't know, spending time making things. And so I started taking more classes in particular from this teacher, this particular teacher who I took that class from, and then started taking some drawing classes and I set up a little studio in my kitchen table, but I had no aspirations to become a professional artist. This was purely for enjoyment, which is, I think, always how one should start <laughs> the creative process. Um, but eventually I started sharing my work on the internet mm. and it was around the time that the internet was becoming a place where artists and writers and people who were experimenting and creative processes were sharing their work um, for the first time with people who they didn't know. Um, previous to the internet, there was no way to do this except if you had an agent or got published. And so I was one of those people who was sort of an early adopter of, you know, that blogging and, you know, sharing images of things on Flickr and things like that. And um, eventually I built a community of people um, or I met a community of people who were doing similar things and, um, People started asking me that if they could buy my work, and um, I said, "Well, I'm not an artist. I'm a I'm just a person who who draws and paints." And um, but then I started to think differently about it because I was drawing and painting all the time. I was getting better and better at it. And then I thought, "Well, maybe I could do this thing all the time because I do absolutely love it." So. Yeah, and, and so how long did that take from, you know, that sort of first tentative class to <laughs> actually leaving your, your job? Because a lot of people think it's like an immediate thing because you're suddenly no. a genius. And I always like to say there's no such thing as overnight success. Um, even people who have what we call overnight success usually have something that they are building upon before, um, even if it happened rather quickly. So I... I started drawing and painting in about 2001. By 2004, I was starting to post it on the internet. And by 2007, I left my job. Um, and by 2011 or 12, I started to make a full-time living as an artist. So <laughs> you'll notice that there was a few years there between leaving my job and making a full-time living as an artist. Mm -hmm. And I was, so I was eating a lot of ramen and, you know, <laughs> Um, living off of savings and things like that. Um, so it took from, you know, between 2001 when I first picked up a paintbrush to 2010, nine years. Um, and I think I could have done it more quickly than that had I had schooling, had I had a guide to show me how to do it. Um, so it's not like it necessarily has to take that long, but for me, that's kind of the way it worked. And do you think that time also uh, reflects your, I guess, uh, apprenticeship as an artist? Because clearly over 10 years, you've become a better artist and therefore people are more likely to pay you for what you do. Yes. And I think most people, you know, go to school for at least four years and study art. And that's sort of the beginning of their apprenticeship. But even even if you do that, it's a really good idea over a period of years to just draw and paint every day or whatever it, your medium is. Um, if you're a writer to write every day, um, there's something about sort of getting your hands dirty and just doing the work every day, practicing, experimenting, trying things, putting it out into the world. And that, so that period of time was my schooling in a way, or the continuation, you know, my schooling plus, 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 plus. Mm. Um, 
And over that period of time, I certainly developed my voice as an artist. And developing your voice as an artist or even a writer is only possible if you do it often. Um, and, you know, you, it just sort of doesn't magically happen. You have to really work at it. Mm. And in the book, which is great, and, you know, it's about visual art, but I think it applies to any artist. And you, yes. talk, you talk about how hard it is for people to say, I'm an artist. And it was so funny because I it took me a long, long time to say I had an affirmation. I am creative. I am an author. For years before I actually was able to say it out loud or actually become that person. So um, how can people overcome that sort of uh, difficulty in saying I'm an artist or I'm a creative? Well, there's this thing that I came to learn existed, and it, it's called imposter syndrome. And um, so there's a name for that. Um, and really, I think it's it's especially true for those of us who maybe started writing or painting or um, making things at an older age. It's not something that we necessarily studied in school or maybe when we were younger aspired to do, but discovered that we might want to do it. And so when we start doing it, we feel like an imposter. We feel like we don't really, if we have success at what we're doing, we don't really deserve it, that eventually someone's going to call us out for being a fake um, <laughs> because we don't really belong to this club that we want to be part of. Um, and so once I understood that there was a name for what I was experiencing, um, that made me feel better because that made me realize other people were going through it as well. And so every time I hear a story like yours, it it's, uh, it's very affirming. And what I learned also is that even people who studied art in school or had very prestigious jobs in the creative field also often feel like imposters in the world. Um, we feel like, you know, somebody else deserves it, but not us. And I think it's particularly true in the, in creative fields. And so I started um, recognizing that all of this insecurity I was feeling about calling myself an artist or putting my work into the world, even though I was doing it, it caused me a lot of anxiety. Um, once I realized that there was a name for it, I started thinking about the fact that it was really unhealthy for me to be feeling that way. And I recognized it as something that was sort of self-defeating and that if I was ever going to experience success, I had to really own my identity as an artist and stop feeling of myself, feeling like I was sort of inferior to other artists. And um, just because I was self-taught or started later in life didn't mean that my work wasn't just as um, important or um, significant as anybody else's. So I just sort of one day declared, you know, like, I'm going to own this. I really had a breakthrough moment. And um, it wasn't like, Immediately, I was confident, you know, it took a lot of practice and a lot of reminding myself when I did feel insecure that um, that my work was valid and that I was, uh, you know, and it was interesting when I when Chronicle Books approached me to write Art Inc., um, which is the book that you referred to earlier, I said, what, me? I, I didn't, you know, like, who am I to talk about how to make a living as an artist? And they said, well, you're doing it. And I said, yes, but I didn't go to school. I'm not from the inside of the art world. I came from the outside. And they said, in fact, wh that's why you're the perfect person to write it, because the book is really for other people who are on the outside of it and want to be on the inside of it. So maybe you can demystify mm -hmm. the art world or the illustration world for them. And um, so, again, I had this moment where I had to own that. And um, while I was writing the book, my editor said, you need to be more authoritative in your, you know, <laughs> like, because I would say, well, this worked for me, but it might not work for you. And she said, no, what worked for you might also work for other people. So you need to just say, this is how I did. This is how I achieved this, this success. Or here's some suggestions for how you can do it. Mm. So I learned to be more authoritative when I wrote the book. And now it's been several years even since I wrote the book. And um, I feel like every year that passes, I get a little bit more confident. But mm. um, but it really was just a lot of self positive self-talk and maybe writing about it on my blog also um, and understanding that this was a universal thing that people experienced, this not being able to claim their identity as a creative person. And I wonder also, I mean, Every time you put out a different artwork, I wonder about the, I mean, you, you obviously got over that big, uh, that big sort of moment, but there's, mm -hmm. for me anyway, I just put out a book this week as well. I know you have, and we'll come back to that. But Congratulations. Thank you. I still, I still have a fear of judgment. 
um, a fear of like people will read it and go, oh my goodness, she thinks those things. It was, you know, a fiction and there's people get killed right. and stuff. Um, and, you know, do you still have that fear of judgment around your artwork or fear of criticism? That sort of, you know, still feeling that you are the person who is within that artwork? Yes, absolutely. And I feel like, you know, I'll sometimes say to people, um, you have to separate, you know, and on a certain level, you have to separate your yourself from your work, um, that when people don't like it, or might criticize it, it's not that they don't like you. Um, they just, it's maybe not their thing. Um, so but to a certain extent, it also is personal, like, mm-hmm. you know, as as creative people, we are everything we make and create, whether it's words or pictures, is an extension of us. So it's really hard not to take it personally. So it's easy for me to say that. But it's a really difficult thing to separate yourself from the criticism, you know, as a, you know, your worth as a human being from potentially any criticism that you may receive. So every time I, yeah, every time I post something or submit something to a client, if I have a job and I've been given an assignment, every time I send off that first piece of artwork that, you know, that I'm, that I'm delivering, I have a tremendous amount of insecurity and anxiety that, that they're not going to like it or that, you know, if I put it on Instagram, people, you know, especially if I'm trying something that I don't normally do and I'm experimenting, I do still have a lot of anxiety because it is very personal. It's something that I potentially that I've worked really hard on and that I believe in. Um, and that, I don't think that ever really goes away. I, I used to think that, eventually as a creative person or as an artist, I would arrive. And I put that in quotes, like that someday. And what I mean by arrive is that someday I would get to a place where criticism didn't bother me, where I felt very confident, where everything I put into the world felt easy. Um, and where my life had a certain, my creative process at least, and my putting my work into the world had a, a certain flow. And I realize now, because I've been doing it for so long now, that that's never going to happen. Like it doesn't really change and that that's not actually a bad thing that our vulnerability as creative people is actually part of what makes us make good work. Mm -hmm. And if we were, um, had no feelings about, um, a vulnerability, we wouldn't be able to be creative people. So, um, I watched this wonderful documentary about painter Gerhard Richter. Um, it's just a it's called Gerhard Richter paintings. And he, and what I love about that film is, you know, he's this like preeminent painter in the world and he paints both very abstractly and, and photorealistically. And he's enormously talented and he's, you know, at the apex of his careers work is in museums all over the world. And, and yet in this film, you see that he's super insecure. You know, he, he makes a painting and then he can't look at it for like five days because he <laughs> thinks it's terrible. And he goes to art openings and, you know, um, he could, it's obviously really awkward about talking to people cause he's really shy. And I thought, okay, here's this guy who, you know, most artists would kill to be, and he's mm-hmm. still hasn't arrived, you know, he's still in that, you know, has a lot of angst about his work and he's not super confident. And that actually, instead of making me feel worse, it made me feel better. It made me accept that, um, that, um, putting your work into the world is always going to be a little bit nerve wracking and requires a lot of bravery. And, but the world wouldn't be what it is if people didn't do that. So I feel like I'm just, um, I don't know, contributing to something bigger than myself, I guess, when I put my work into the world. And I hope that other people feel that way too. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you in terms of the writing as well. And, and I was also thinking about why we keep driving us, uh, driving ourselves to do more. And I think it's, uh, to me, it's kind of like every, when we finished a piece of work, when we say it's finished, there's always an edge of that's not the end. That's not the best. Mm -hmm. That's not actually the best I can do, or it's the best I could do on that piece. But that's not, you know, there's always this need to do something further. Is that something you you feel as well? Is that actually inherently what drives us to create more? Yes, I think so. And, um, you know, every now and again, I would say every of every like 200 pieces of art that I make, there's one that I think is like, pretty darn good. And I'm, I don't feel like I need to change it much, but that's a really, you know, that's what two less than 1% of the time, (laughs) (laughs) most of the time, 
I've either I'm on a tight deadline and I've got to do the best I can do and or I just feel like I'm maxed out on a particular piece and I know it's not perfect but I don't quite know what to do mm -hmm. to make it better or I'm afraid if I try I might mess it up more <laughs> yeah. um, you know <laughs> and that goes for my writing and my you know my painting and drawing so you know, I, sometimes I just say, this is good enough and I leave it be, but yeah, but then, and then I turn it in or I put it out into the world because you have to do that. And I think a lot of people, um, who don't actually are, are not very productive, creative, or maybe very smart, um, and creative people inside, but aren't productive, creative people are usually people who are perfectionists and mm. refuse to put anything into the world because it's not perfect and because they know it's not perfect. So I think that's what separates um, people who um, who are productive, creative people and who people who are not is just this willingness to put something into the world that they know is not perfect. And what is perfect, right? Mm. Anyway, so that, that's a whole existential conversation. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I don't know. And I think that for me, you know, there's sort of like this period where, where I'm working really hard on something and I'm trying to get it to be as good as it can be. But then there's a period where I just have to let it go and move on. And you're right that after I've put that baby out into the world, I have to start creating another one because, um, and I think it's, you know, partly generated by this need to continue to improve or do something even more fantastic than we did before. But it's also partly, um, because we have new ideas or, um, we're sort of bored with what we were doing before and we want to try something new. So, um, fortunately there's lots of different things that fuel us to keep going and putting things out into the world. Yeah, absolutely. And that's actually a, another question I had for you, which is, uh, you know, when you start being a productive creative like that, ideas are never the problem, as in you have generally so many ideas uh, that there are lots of options as to what to create next. So uh, apart from having a job from a client, how do you know what you're going to create next? How do you decide between all of those ideas? Yeah, so, so, I, so a lot of what I do is client work, but um, a lot of what I do is actually very self-generated. Even the books that I create, I have a lot of artistic freedom from my publishers. Um, and I do a lot of personal projects. So, um, you know, I make work on a regular basis that's just for me or in my sketchbook or for a personal project that I'm doing. And, um, you know, I come to the inspiration to create those things in a variety of ways. Sometimes um, it's through travel. I'll travel somewhere and my eyes will be opened up to a culture that I've never been part of or, you know, some art and design that I've never experienced before that I find really inspirational. Um, and I also am sort of a avid reader or looker at um, like visual history of cultures and things like folk pattern and architecture and um, even nature in particular parts of the world um, and how those things influence things like um, graphic design and art and folk pattern in a particular culture. And so I'm sort of like a, a visual junkie and I collect a lot of um, visual imagery and sometimes in my travels and then sometimes just by looking at books and at the internet. So um, I'm constantly collecting inspiration that way. Um, you know, and I, I think in this day and age of the internet, it's, we're in this sort of, especially for visual artists, we're, we're, we're sort of in this slippery place because on the one hand, um, the internet is where we get our inspiration. Um, but on the other hand, it's dangerous to get too much inspiration mm -hmm. from the internet because then your work becomes iterative or like, just like everybody else's. So there's always this internal fight to, um, you know, open yourself up to being inspired by what you see, but also doing your own thing and making your work uniquely yours. And there are trends in art and design and illustration. And so, um, and it's great to be part of those trends and to be a leader, um, in those areas. But at the same time, you want to make your work stand out as being different, or at least I do. Mm. Um, so gathering visual inspiration on the internet is where I, I do see a lot of things that, that inspire me, including the work of other artists. Um, and I think it's hard not to do that. I just, people ask me a lot about creative block and I do have it sometimes, you know, periods when I'm not inspired and I don't know what I'm going to make yet next. Um, but 
I know that I need to usually take a break. That means I'm pretty mm-hmm. burned out um, and that I need to sort of step back and not try. Sometimes just taking a break and not forcing yourself to make something or draw something or paint something is the way to go. Um, I do, I'm doing a project right now where I'm making a painting a week outside of my regular art practice um, and posting it on the internet every Monday on my blog. And there are, I usually make them on Saturday or Sunday. And there are Saturdays and Sundays when I don't really want to be in my studio. I just want to be outside or I want to be at the movies or, but I'm forcing myself to do this personal work and I sit down and I'm like, ugh. but then once I get started, I get really into it. So sometimes it's just forcing yourself to push through that moment of angst, like, what am I going to make today? Or I don't really feel inspired. Hmm. Um, so it's complicated being a, being a creative person. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think everyone listening understands that. But I wondered, because, you know, you're a, primarily a visual artist, but you've also got a lot of books, um, lots, yes. of, lots of books on lots of different things. So I wondered, uh, what are the similarities and differences between your visually creative work and your written creative work? I feel like when I approach writing, um, and I've been writing on my blog, I used to write a lot more essays and long form pieces than I do now because I'm so much busier as an artist, um, you know, with working with clients and whatnot. But I, um, I feel like when I sit down to write something, um, I have sometimes a much harder time getting started. So you have the blank, the blank page as a writer and you have the blank canvas as Mm -hmm. an artist. And I would say, um, with paint, I can just, um, I know that I can layer over something if I, paint something and I don't like it, I can start over or paint over it. So there's, it's not that hard for me to start often with writing. I will often stare at the blank page and not know. It's like, you have to start, you have to type that first sentence (laughs) and that's often the hardest it's. So I find writing much harder, but I also don't do as much of it. And perhaps if I did more of it, um, you know, I, it wouldn't feel as intimidating, like, um, starting, throwing paint on a canvas doesn't feel intimidating to me. And I bet you a lot of your writers listening will probably feel the opposite because they are maybe more used to writing, but then when they do something, make something with their hands, um, it might feel harder because Mm. they're just afraid of messing it up or they're not as comfortable with how to, you know, how to start. And, um, but what, but I do find that once I get into writing, it just, um, and I'm writing about something that feels important to me whether it's a story or I'm expressing an opinion about something or I'm teaching somebody some, you know, new knowledge. I, I, I enjoy it so much and it flows out of me. I could spend the entire day writing. Mm. So getting started at writing is harder for me, but, um, once I get into it, I really do love it and I wish I had more time for it. Um, so yeah well, that's really interesting because I was just thinking then the thought of having a blank canvas and I, lo- I really like the color blue and I'm like well what if I put a big blue smart a s- sort of smudge in the middle of the page in yeah. the, on the canvas and that's gonna look really crap and you know then what to do next that kind of fear of it looking bad but like mm-hmm. you're saying you could you then paint over it or whatever I could give it to you you could paint over it but but that um I was wondering about that as an editing process, because, of course, the writing process, you write your draft and then you probably edit it and then you give it to an editor. Is there an equivalent with your visual art? Do you have an external editor Mm -hmm. or are you the editor of of visual art? Well, in my personal work, I'm generally the editor and I will often if I especially if I'm having a show or doing something public with my work, I will often get the opinions of people um, I trust typically our other artist friends to come over and say, do you think this painting is done? Do you think I need to push it a little further? Um, I work by myself in my studio now. I have a studio manager, but she's not an artist. Mm. And, but I used to work in a, in a big studio with lots of other artists. And so I would just call them over and say, hey, guys, um, let's, do you mind giving me a little critique mm. right now? But that was my choice and something that I invited. But with my, most of my illustration work, it very, is very similar to working with an editor if you're publishing a book or a magazine article. Mm. So um, usually you start with a sketch so that you don't get too far down the road if they're like, no, that's not what I was looking for. That's not going to work. Um, so you turn in, uh, like I'm about to start a book cover for Simon & Schuster. 
and um, I'm going to get on the phone next week with the art director. She's going to say, this is what the book's about. I've sent you the manuscript. Maybe skim over it. Here are some ideas for what could be on the cover. And then I'll sketch about six different ideas um, very loosely in pencil. And I'll send those off. And then she will say, I really like this this one. Hmm. So why don't you push this one a little further and here's how you might change it. Can you make it a little tighter? And then eventually the sketch gets approved. We call it a rough sketch. And then you're allowed to move on to final artwork. So at least the form of things is set. And, um, and then you add color and, you know, take it and make it look like it's going to go on the cover of a book. And even then at the end of that process, it's also possible that they say, oh, those colors don't work, or you might have to step back or even start over. Um, but in the world of illustration, we try to design the process so that you don't get to the end. And then, you know, writing is really much easier to edit mm. than artwork. I mean, <laughs> because we have Photoshop now where a lot of people do work digitally, it's much easier to change your artwork than it's ever been. Um, but generally speaking, um, you know, it's it's hard. It's it's typically harder and more time consuming than editing writing. So you have to we try to create a process where um, there are fewer chances that you're going to turn something in that is that people aren't that your client isn't going to like, and you're going to have to start over, Hmm. um, by taking baby steps and checking in along the way, as opposed to just turning in the final thing and saying, do you like this? That rarely happens that way. Yeah. So that's the good news. (laughs) Well, that's really interesting. And of course there, you mentioned designing a book cover for a client and you have a ton of different income streams. You're an entrepreneur (laughs) as well as an artist, which is so brilliant. Can you just give us an overview of all the different things that you work on that make up your creative business? Sure. Um, and I'll probably forget at least one because I do so many that every time I, somebody asks me this question afterwards, I was like, oh, yeah, I forgot that one thing. Um, so the main the main source of income for me now is, is books and book, book illustration. And that includes making my own books. So I'm working on my seventh book now. My sixth book just came out this week. Um, and then I'm in contract for eight and nine already, although I won't start those until later this year. Um, so I also illustrate other people's books, Mm. either cover and interior or just interiors or just cover. So I do a lot of that. Um, I do a little bit of editorial illustration and surface design illustration, like wallpaper, note cards, wrapping paper, stationery, that kind of thing. So illustration writ large, including my own books, other people's books and my own books. I also write Mm. or edit. So if, other people are contributing things, then, you know, I edit and collect that information. Like right now I'm working on a book that has interviews and essays with other people in it. It's not just my writing. Um, so that's a big chunk. Um, I also teach mostly online classes. So I teach through, um, a few different, uh, online forums, creative bug being the main one. And I teach just very, easy art classes for people who aren't necessarily professional artists or don't even necessarily aspire to be, but want to have more creativity and learn how to draw Mm -hmm. things like that. Um, I do some public speaking. So I travel all over the world to give keynote addresses and talk at colleges and, um, at creative conferences and blogging conferences. In fact, I'm coming to London in June, oh, uh, to, to give the keynote address. Yeah. I haven't been to London in, or Great Britain in, since, uh, 1998. So I'm very oh, excited. Yeah. You're, um, London's yeah. a lot better. <laughs> I, everybody tells me it's changed so much. Yeah. Um, so, um, I also have an Etsy shop. So that's my online shop that I've had for almost 10 years. And, um, I sell prints and copies, signed copies of my book, um, things like that. Um, I get, um, a, you know, through a lot of these things like licensing my work, which I consider illustration, mm-hmm. my books, um, the classes I teach, um, I make royalties or, uh, percentages of the sales of things. So a lot of my income is very unpredictable because while I do get 
flat fees for things and advances that I can count on. A lot of my income is just depends on how well something has sold that has my artwork on it or how well a class that I teach is doing out in the world. Mm. So, um, but those are really the main things. Um, I enjoy all of them a lot. And so I continue to do all of them. And, um, you know, there's some things along the way that I don't do as much of, like I'm having a show, I think, either this fall or next year in New York, like a fine art show, like Ooh. selling original work, not reproductions of things and not books. And, um, that's something I used to do a lot, but it's very time consuming mm. and, um, to like make a, a big body of work. And then you don't really make as much money selling it. You work really hard and then you can only sell your paintings for a certain amount of money. And then it just depends mm. on somebody being willing to buy them. But I do love that. So I don't do it as often. Maybe once every two or three years, I'll have a big show. Um, so that's also happening. But I wouldn't, I don't consider it a major contributor to my income. It's just more something that I do. So there's a lot of things that I do that fall into that category. Like they're not income generators, but I do them because I love to do them. And I do a lot of pro bono work for organizations and um, places that, um, that are not, you know, raising money for causes that I believe in as well. Mm, which is great because I think some people consider full-time artist as like in the same way they consider full-time writer you're just sitting in a room creating art over and over again or sitting in a room writing 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 but it's a lot more than that isn't it and I wondered uh, you also said in your book that promoting your work can be just as creative and fulfilling as making the artwork which a lot of people would go no way no I want to just be a creative <laughs> and create um, so how does that how do you balance that running the business, the marketing and the creative side of things? Well, for many years, I did it all by myself. Um, now I have an employee um, who helps me with all of that. But my business has grown so much and the, the opportunities that come my way are so, um, you know, they're so much more fruitful than they used to be. And that's what happens as your career grows, your opportunities grow and mm -hmm. your potential to do well financially grows. So I, um, I do have a lot of support, but my time is very, still very much divided between the sitting at the drawing table, as you say, which is, I think what people envision that I do eight hours a day. Mm -hmm. But, um, and some days I do get to do that eight hours a day, but most of the time there's a lot of sitting at the computer, um, and working at my, now my assistant answers a lot of my email, but I, I still have to field things for her. I still have to tell her how she should respond to things. So there's a lot of administrative stuff. Um, and then marketing is really important. And part of the reason my career has become successful is because I got comfortable really early on with putting my work into the world. Um, again, even though it was intimidating and even though I knew it wasn't perfect mm -hmm. and, um, I just didn't wait, um, for it to be perfect or to feel comfortable. And I decided that I was going to embrace the process of promoting my work. So, you know, how can I make this fun for myself? And until Instagram came around, um, you know, I was mostly using my blog and then sort of, I would tweet about whatever I wrote about, but since my work is very visual, it's important for there to be a place where people can actually look at it. Mm. And I suppose for a writer, there needs to be a place for people to be able to read what you wrote and for you to talk about it. And, um, so I, I use my blog in that way a lot to drive people to a place where they can see what I'm talking about or read the words that I've written. And, um, I like, I, I, re I feel very, as a creative person, you know, um, every few years I'll change my blog design and I'll get someone, a high, I'll hire a graphic designer to help me rebrand and like make the space where people come to look at my work really inviting and interesting and easy to access all the information about me that they want to know, like, where can they buy something? Where can they come hear me speak? Mm. What's my email if they want to ask me a question? Um, and then on Instagram, uh, which is the social media platform that I use the most, I use that to both for, to mostly share what's going on, um, what I'm making, what I'm working on. Um, if I'm having an event coming up, I'll post a little image and a description. Um, I post a, tidbits from my personal life, you know, pictures of my cats or, um, <laughs> you know, of, you know, if I travel, which I'd like to do, I'll take pictures of the place that I visit and the things that inspire me. Um, but it is very much a, a feed that is dedicated to, you know, the visual look and feel of my, of my business. And to me, that's just really fun. Mm. Um, 
you know, I do understand that marketing is really not fun for everybody, but I, my advice is always like figure out, you know, think about how to make marketing fun for yourself and do it that way because it will feel the most authentic and the le- the least salesy mm. and inauthentic if you really are doing the stuff you love and talking about the stuff you love and sharing the stuff that you love to share as opposed to doing sharing things that you think you should be sharing or mm. doing it in a way that you think you should be doing it. Yeah. Um, and that, that being authentic is kind of the only way to do this long term. But I, I wanted to ask you about that because at the moment in the writing community, there's a lot of people who are saying, oh, they, they, they just can't sustain the pace of the indie writing mm-hmm. world, which, you know, it's kind of sped up the writing process. Yes. Um, so what do you see separates the long term successful, productive creatives who are still happy and creating uh, to those people who kind of burn out and fade away? Well, I think what's really important, and one of the reasons I haven't burned out and faded away, is that um, I work really hard to uh, to take care of myself and um, make sure that I'm not working more than, I mean, occasionally I work 10-hour days, but most of the time I just work eight hours a day. I try to not work at night. I try to keep regular daylight hours. And I, I know some people work better at night. And there's actually, I think, a stereotype that writers and artists only like to work at night, <laughs> that drunk. we're sort of weirdos, <laughs> yeah, and that we're drunk. Um, and, you know, so if that works for you, fine. But um, for me, I just, I feel like I've tried to abandon this idea that I need to struggle or that um, being an artist should feel hard and that um, I'm, you know, that creative people are just as entitled to feel happy and to have an abundant life as anybody else. And so, um, you know, I, I take breaks, I take vacations, I make sure that I get regular massages. <laughs> I get out and walk around and run and enjoy my life and my friends. And of course there are periods where I do feel burned out and where I say, Oh, why did I take that project? It's mm. putting me over the edge. You know, if I had only not said yes to that project, I'd be fine. But inevitably, I get through the project and I learn from the experience. And Mm -hmm. I'm really trying to have more boundaries around the amount of work that I take. And um, once you're, you know, it's sort of like when as creative people, we dream when we start out, we dream of the day that our work is in demand. Like that's where everyone wants to be in the place where their email box is flooded with requests and they have choices and Mm -hmm. people want to work with them. But I'll tell you the minute that that happens it becomes even more stressful and overwhelming. And if you don't figure out a way to manage that and to detach yourself from that, because you have to say no a lot, because you can't say yes to every opportunity. Um, if you, if you don't figure out a way to manage that, you will burn out and you will shrivel up and (laughs) feel angry and tired most of the time, instead of feeling joyful and grateful for what you have. And, um, so I'm always trying to strike that balance. And it's I'm not saying it's easy, hmm. but I work really hard at like taking care of myself um, and my relationship and making time for my family and um, making sure that if I do go through periods where I'm working all of the time, that it's followed by periods of time where I'm not working very much at all. And, um, and I'm getting better and better at that the older I get. But um, hmm. so that's sort of how I deal with that. Yeah, and I think as you say, it's it, it's a, a permanent rebalancing of of what you're doing. Uh, so, like, I I just come back from Austin, and then I did London Book Fair, and as an introvert, speaking is very difficult. So I was like. Mm-hmm okay, I shouldn't have done back to back. That's yep. like, and I know that I just, I just overbooked myself. So it's kind of the lessons we learn. Um, but all of that was fantastic. Now I wanted to, we've only got a couple more minutes. And I wanted to ask you about your latest book, which is <laughs> The Joy of Swimming, which is kind of an amazing title. Tell us about that book and why write a book on on swimming? Well, it happened um, in an interesting way. It wasn't an idea that I necessarily had you know, packed away in the back of my brain for some time. Like I always wanted to make a book about swimming. (laughs) Um, I published a book a few years ago called whatever you are, be a good one. And there is a fairly long essay in the beginning, but most of the book is hand lettered, um, like literary quotations that I love. And, um, the book's done very well. And so it's sort of my bread and butter right now. (laughs) It won't be forever, but so anyway, when, when it started, was obvious that it was doing well and people were, a lot of people were buying it. Um, my editor said to me, 
um, two things. I'd like to make a sequel, which we did, which of course isn't doing as well because <laughs> <laughs> as writers, you know, second books never do as well as first books that have done well. Um, well, or maybe they do, but generally not. Um, but then she said, if you could make a book about whatever you wanted, what would that be? And of course, at first I was like, I have no idea. And I started to think about all of the things that I could make a book about and um, all these ideas that I had. And swimming was definitely one is one of the things that I'm passionate about. I've been a lifelong swimmer. I um, And there aren't a lot of illustrated books about swimming, but it was the one idea compared to some of the others that I other ideas for books that I entertained that I felt like could translate well into an illustrated book. And, um, so my editor thought it was a great idea. I wrote up a little, you know, proposal about what might go in it and, um, started the process of brainstorming and organizing my ideas. The, um, pub my publishing house, the one that I work with most often is called Chronicle Books. They loved the idea and I set to work on it. And so I started swimming when I was, a little kid. Um, I started swimming competitively when I was eight years old and I swam competitively through high school. I didn't swim in college mostly because I didn't have the discipline required. Um, you know, being a collegiate swimmer is like, or, or any, a collegiate athlete of any kind is an, an incredibly intense experience. And, um, and then, but when I was in my twenties, I started swimming again, in master swimming, which is like a worldwide organization for adult mm. competitive or organized swimming. And I was a coach and swimming really changed my life. It helped me get through a lot of very hard times in my 20s and early 30s. Um, the swimming community in San Francisco where I used to live was um, a community that was really near and dear to my heart. And so when I started making the book, I was researching all kinds of things like the history of the swimming pool and the history of competitive swimming and the history of the bathing suit. Um, like how was the bikini invented? And um I got really nerdy about all of these different aspects of swimming that I knew nothing about. I had a real natural curiosity, which I think is important when you're making a book, especially mm -hmm. a nonfiction book, that you actually are genuinely interested in the subject matter. And um, so the book is a kind of mishmash of, um, you know, profiles of swimmers um, who have some, some of them have pretty incredible stories, um, illustrations of that are very nostalgic in nature, some infographics that talk about swimming pool culture in different countries and, um, you know, the science of swimming and, you know, the history of the swimming pool, all those kinds of things and lots of hand lettered literary quotations, which I love. Um, and, uh, it's very colorful and there's like, oh my gosh, like over a hundred Every page has an illustration on it, except for a couple of pages in my introduction, and the book is 144 pages, so it's very colorful, and um, and I'm really excited to have it in the world. So, <laughs> Oh, that's brilliant. So where can people find The Joy of Swimming and Art Inc. and your artwork and everything you yeah. have online? <laughs> well, the first place to go is my website, which is lisacongdon.com, and on my website, there are links to my Etsy shop where, depending on stock, um, cause I'm not Amazon. I can't have like 10,000 books in my garage. Um, <clears throat> uh, depending on stock, people can get signed copies of my books. Um, uh, of course, Amazon, um, all of the Amazon affiliates out in the world, Amazon UK, um, all of the online venues like Barnes and Noble, et cetera, um, sell all of my books. So, um, there are also, most of my books are in bookstores all over the world as well. So, um, if somebody wants one and they can't find it online, I would just go to your local bookstore and, and ask, but you can also buy my artwork in my, um, and some of my products that are out in the world, um, through my website as well. So if you're looking for something in particular, you can just browse. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, Lisa. That was great. Thank you so much for having me, Joanna.